and welcome, welcome, welcome to the Pixelated Sausage Show or something like that. I am, of course, your host, Mark Krishnez. Hi. Hi, 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 hi. I sound like a little Martian thing from Toy Story. Hi, 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 hi. As you can tell, I did not go back and look at the old way I did the intro to get a refresher on my much needed frame of reference in terms of what I used to do. So we're just doing what we just did. Hi. I don't have all that much to talk about news wise or anything along those lines. I'll probably get right into what I've been playing, which includes includes the plucky squire perennial order an arcade leo the firefighter cat econi island or Econe island an earthlock adventure and road defense outsiders but before i get to all that i have been making a lot of poor decisions with my streaming games and my attack the backlog games where i've had a bunch of stinkers as of late we had kenna episode two the last episode of that that just went up and then it'll be the break and then it's going to be golf story which i did not have a good time with followed by i believe after that it's a single episode for writer's republic which was okay then Spider-Man Miles Morales, which more Spider-Man. And then we just got through two nights of Exo Primal, which I didn't particularly enjoy. And I know there are fans of that game that talk about how it opens up after a certain amount of time, but I'll talk about that more in the Attack of the Backlog for it, but I looked into how much time until things open up, supposedly, and I don't know how they exactly open up, but if you want me to wait that long for some kind of change, you better make what I'm doing in the now engaging enough and interesting enough and fun enough for me to want to power through. And Exo Primal did do it. What a weird, weird game. I'll discuss that more in its specific episode, though. But I feel like I need something real meaty now. But then I also don't know if I'm in the right headspace to get lost in a world the way the world would deserve. Maybe it is truly time. I almost played Dragon's Dogma 1. Maybe it is time to finally play that but I don't know if I would prefer something that's meaty but still narrative driven in a very hand-holdy way something that has a long story and it's just a much more guided thing not quite to the level of a Final Fantasy 13 but something like Perhaps a Persona or a similar game. I'm humoring Kingdom Hearts, but I look at that and I think the last time I played it, I found the combat not that great in the little bit I played of it. And do I want to frustrate myself with that game? Or do I just want to put it on easy and experience the story? Why Why am I playing the game? Is it for the story and the nonsense of it? Or is it for the gameplay? And you can't change the difficulty afterwards. So that's a big question there. A lot of questions. I've been humoring some second runs too. Since we're going to have quite the backlog. The, the cushion. The schedule of Attack of the Backlog episodes. And I think... Maybe in a month's time or so, we could say by Halloween, potentially, maybe attack the backlog with the new way it's formatted and all that, where it's 
easier but not easy to put together an episode. Maybe it might become a weekly thing. But that is not something I want to put out there and cement it as if it is a guarantee thing going to happen. But I feel like it would make sense and it would work out that way. And if I keep with the week breaks, it could just get really drawn out. And for some people, uh, they're, they're very different in terms of what you're getting out of it. The streams are a hangout type of experience. And the Attack the Backlog episodes are a consolidation of my overall thoughts from that experience. You can see me in the moment when I'm streaming and watch how my emotions and feelings change over time, potentially drastically or subtly. But it's really just a, a means to watch the game if, you, if you're interested in that. And more so than that, just hang out, chit chat, talk about stuff like the MCU, which I have continued making progress in. I have started to watch the shows I just finished Loki season one and two, already did Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision, lesser on WandaVision in a repeat of viewing. And of course, if you want to see my actual ratings, letterbox.com, PX sauce is there like everywhere and cheeky reviews. I don't do any kind of serious reviews there. I am still humoring, doing more thought out reviews, maybe for the site, maybe for the Patreon, maybe for nowhere, I don't know. But on Letterboxd, I just feel like putting some kind of stupid thing in the, the review itself. But I am excited to watch Hawkeye next because that is one of the series I looked at in the grand list of all the series that have come out that I'm going to be rewatching or watching for the first time as one that I think has the potential to be higher on a rewatch and the other one would be Miss Marvel where I think there's a chance that I could like it more not excited about rewatching Secret Invasion Secret Invasion is the show that maybe just give up on MCU. I, I haven't watched anything since Secret Invasion. I have watched What If for the first time, which feels like a very pointless show. I don't like its format, its structure, this connected anthology type of show. I was talking with Lunchbox and saying that I think episodes come in two forms. One, they're so stupid or dumb or uninteresting that they have no reason to exist. Or two, they are interesting, but the brief runtime of at most 30, 35 minutes, if you or after you factor in the seven ish minutes of credits, which is still crazy in these MCU shows that have credits that long. But you have these other ones that are interesting, but the runtime does not give enough time for the ideas, the alternate takes on various storylines to fully develop in a satisfying way for me, at least. I think of the Killmonger episode where he... That's not... What the, he didn't join Nova. That was someone else but he he, he he was something or other and he teamed up with Tony and all that stuff and I looked at that episode and thought I would have liked to have seen this in a feature length duration or the Marvel Zombies episode or other various ones and what I think would have been a better way of handling the what if stories is if they did them in feature length animated styles akin to how 
DC Warner Brothers handles DC animated movies where they are telling different stories, alternate stories, and have done an overall good job. They they vary in terms of how much they hit or miss. I think I haven't even watched it, but I just remember the trailer for the killing joke looked really, really bad. But then there are plenty of ones that do a good job of either telling a story that is directly from a graphic novel. They might all do that. Or there could be some original stuff in there. I guess it would be Warner Brothers that did the Batman versus TMNT one, which is fun. It wasn't great or anything, but it was fun. But I think that would have been a better direction for the what if stories. But that's not what we got. Instead, we get these short episodes that are either too short to explore cool ideas enough or just super dumb. The Thor party episode where the fact that Loki isn't taken in by Odin means Thor turns into this party animal and Loki is his best bud from another mother. (laughs) whatever okay fine and then the way in which all of those stories start to intertwine and feel more important than just these tangents is a little annoying to me as well can can any can fucking something just be its own thing does everything have to eventually meld into this giant mcu out of fucking i don't even know anymore everything after phase three is just been messy and yeah there are some bright stars in phase four onward loki overall is great i think season three or season two is pretty weak overall it has its high points but there are are things i don't love about it it gets super convoluted I remember there's a part about 14 minutes in episode five where Loki is talking to Obi, is that his name? The the guy from Everything Everywhere All at Once and of course short round from Indiana Jones and the last not the last crusade temple of doom and the Asian kid from the Goonies. I don't remember what his name was in the Goonies. But I loved him. He's my favorite character from the Goonies because I loved his gadgetry and creativeness that really, surprisingly, more than a lot of things, that specifically, that character inspired the hell out of me because I had this giant tub of hand-me-down toys and random knickknacks that I would combine in various ways to try and make hybrid toys I had my turtle van that I put a whole bunch of stuff on that was inspired by the tank and tank girl. So I put on a little, what do you call it? Were they mo- not model houses, doll house. So I had a little sofa from one of those that I got from something and I put that on top. Who cares? But it just... In, in that scene, he goes back, Loki goes back and talks to his that character pre-everything when he was just a fantasy writer who on the side worked as some kind of science dude because you gotta pay the bills. And he says a bunch of stuff and then Loki says to him, I don't know what you just said. And that is how I feel about a lot of season two. I think. When you start messing with all of this time travel and stuff, like, the more and more you mess with all that and alternate realities, things are going to get more and more convoluted because that's just inherent to those types of stories and those concepts where you have to accept that it's not going to make sense. This t- time travel, especially, I look at it and just like the whole idea of time travel is stupid because when you start messing around with time travel, what what, what is... That, that, that that's it that's the, that's the question what is because once time travel exists it always exists 
If it exists in the future, then it exists in the past because time. So fucking who, what? And then how does that? We, it, it, nothing is just, if time travel exists, it, nothing matters. Because what's happening right now is directly, a, is directly because of people going in the past and it's just, fucking who cares you can't change anything because you've already changed it or you didn't change it and it doesn't matter you're, you're already thinking to yourself right now what are you talking about this is confusing exactly time travel but for me overall I, I gave Loki to be more specific with that one three and a half stars out of five because the first season very strong form four for me Flirting with a 4.5. And then the second season is in that 2.5 to 3 range where there are things I like and then things I really don't like. And it's just a mixed bag. I really, really, really don't like ignoring all of the exterior stuff about him as a person that came out and all that jazz. I don't like Jonathan Major's performance as Victor Timely. I hate I don't like it at all. It's very annoying and grating. But enough about that. Let's get on to what I've been playing. I was just talking about this and that because I feel like there's got to be some kind of rambling nonsense to start off the episode. If I just get into what I've been playing, it's not going to feel like a real episode. So we're going to start with The Plucky Squire, which I played for about three-ish hours, maybe two and a half got through the first four chapters and it seems like maybe the next one is going to be a bit more open i'm in a town area with a lot of npcs that i can talk to so maybe the story open up a bit there but based on the achievements and the progress they show in there where i'm at i'm roughly 40 percent through the game and I can't help but be disappointed. It is a beautiful game. It looks great. If you don't know what the Plague Squire is, it's a game about this young kid, Jot, I believe his name is, who is a young adventurer in this, this storybook. And as it's going on in the early parts of the story, the evil bad guy starts to become aware of what's going on and knows realizes they're the villain of this story and kicks the plucky squire out of the book you get back in the book and then there is this dynamic of going in the book and out of the book to solve puzzles and so on so you get this 2d picture book aesthetic that is really pleasant And then this very vibrant 3D action platformer gameplay every now and again mixed in there uh, as well. So it has that cool dynamic. But the problem with the game is that the actual gameplay is not that engaging or fun or interesting. The art is great. The story is fun simple whatever it's very typical stuff so far maybe it'll get different over time but the the vibe of the story that i would most compare to is the smurfs it feels very smurfs ish without it being about nothing but blue people but the villain feels Gargamesh, whatever that character's name is from Smurfs, that even the, the the way it's told in this very light and slightly rhythmic way, it's not rhyming. It's, it's not always rhyming like you get in a Smurf story, but it it has that feel to it. It's very playful. It's a fun story, and the game is oozing with charm. It is very charming, and it is 
that the the story the charm the art that is pushing me through the unengaging aspect of playing it because when you are adventuring in either world 2d or 3d and fighting some enemies it's very simple it's not challenging and then when you are tasked with doing puzzles a lot of which are in the 2d area and a lot of them because it is a storybook involve you seeing small little sentences and there is a word that has some sparkles coming off of it that you can hit and knock off and switch out with other words to change the environment in various ways or change the time of day make a staircase larger so that you can get through it fix a broken bridge etc you are doing a lot of tedious work of moving these words around and then in some cases getting out of the book to flip through the pages go back a little bit to get a word from a different part of the book and then bring it to the other part and that form of puzzle solving was interesting for a little while but it's already become kind of dull and part of that is because there is some fun to be had with using words to make weird things happen and there are a handful of achievements around doing some of that from what i've seen so far there isn't a lot of creativity for you to mess with it seems like puzzles can only be solved in one way because there was a time where i made a bridge or some staircases very large but i couldn't get through them even though i i would if but this npc character was standing in the way when i did that and the only way i could really solve it is to do what it wanted me to do which was just fix the bridge instead of making it very large or, or, or whatever ex the exact case was and then the combat is very simple you got your sword you just hack and slash dodge roll and then every now and again it'll throw in some kind of gimmicky gameplay element typically with boss type fights one where you are doing a boss fight in a punch out type of style and another where you had a bow and arrow and you were just moving a cursor on the screen and shooting some bugs with it as they moved around and those are yet another weakness in the gameplay where they are these tiny little things you're just doing for specific things in that specific moment they're incredibly shallow and not fun they are a poor imitation of what the inspiration was the, the, the punch out section doesn't feel anywhere near as good as actual punch out and you might be saying well I'm not I wouldn't expect that because it's just this one little part well I'd expect something from it more than yeah it, it just felt like a waste of my time it, why why are we even doing this if it's not going to feel good why are we even doing it because you're just making me think of the better version and making me think well why am I not playing that so there are good ideas here that just aren't done well enough it has the charm it has the story which is something if you've been a listener for a long time you know that stories often don't do a lot for me but here i'm i'm interested in the story uh, of jot and his buddies as they're going through this thing and, and wanting to get back to the adventure. It's a very beautiful game. But it just doesn't quite land where it's most important, and that's in the gameplay. But that is again the Plucky Squire. Next we have Perennial Order, which I played a bit of. And this is... A very, very cool, funky game from a purely visual standpoint and also 
a story standpoint where you are this corpse-ish character that feels very hodgepodge. A lot of the game, it, it describes itself as a 2D plant-based eldritch, eldritch horror boss rush game. And that is at the world, the characters, the enemy, everything about the, the, the world and the art feels like it took a bunch of thrown out materials and just stitched a whole bunch of stuff together in a very, very cool, funky way. It's all very 2D and, and feels like someone took a bunch of dirty pieces of paper, crumpled pieces. It just, it's very funky looking and reminds me of some of the more funky out there Xbox Live Arcade games from the 360 era. It has kind of that funkiness of a Xeno Clash or some of the better Xbox Live indie games from the old XNA days that I find very, very appealing. And the way the game works is that you are going through the world, learning more about it in a fairly organic way and getting to various bosses of, of different areas. And what'll make it appealing to some and unappealing to others is that it is a one hit death game. So you die whenever you get hit. Just once you're dead, go back to the last checkpoint. Pretty generous checkpoints. You can't play cooperative level, which could be cool. But the, the boss fights themselves are very pattern based and the patterns will change through various stages. So once you get a, a boss to a certain stage, the pat patterns will change. And it's very much so about you learning all the patterns of a boss upon repeated tries and figuring out how to get through those. Because at your disposal, you have initially just a, a sword, which feels more like a fencing sword. And as you defeat bosses and progress, you'll unlock new abilities that you can use. You equip which ones you want. So something that will, you, you collect these three wisp, I think, at the very beginning that you can utilize for either dashing out of the way of attacks or building up an attack so that it's more powerful. And I find it all very, very fascinating. I don't love the combat though, because the combat is tied to the right analog stick. You're, it's just melee now. Maybe there'll be some ranged weapons later. But the way it works is that you push the analog stick in the direction you want to attack and you hold it and then let go when it reaches the top of this meter to do a strong attack, to do a critical attack. It feels very much like taking the reload system of Gears of War after reload and incorporating that into melee combat by having you push in the direction you want to attack with your sword and holding it until it gets to this meter, gets up to this meter and hits this sweet spot and letting go at the right time to do critical attacks. There is some satisfaction there but it also feels a little the more i play it the more i am getting accustomed to it but it still is something where i just like the way traditional games play where as i talked about in my kenna attack the battle episodes i remap the buttons to the face buttons because i just like in melee games third person action adventure games to have my light attack attack uh, map to the X button and heavy to I just like it to be traditional I'm an old fogey don't try new things but the more I play it the more I am 
liking it. And that's that's pretty much it. I I didn't quite know what to go to expect going into it, but I, I've been pleasantly surprised. It feels like it'll speak very well to Souls fans in various ways. The challenge of the boss fights and that being the majority of the game, there's still some stuff to, to, to deal with on the way to get to these various boss fights. But the, the way the storytelling is very much so on you and how it develops and how you learn more about the world through the world it is fascinating the art is gonna turn some people off for sure you should definitely look at screenshots because that might already be a deterrent for some people because it's very garage bandy grungy just grimy kind of nasty icky in the best ways possible it just feels very funky it's just it's a funky game and I'm digging it there's a good challenge there and I, I'd be curious how much playing with another person takes away from that challenge I, I, I don't know if there's any kind of balancing that they do adjustments but I believe with another person you're then able to revive the other player which would make things easier, of course, as well as just having someone else there to engage in a boss fight. But that is again perennial order. And arcade is a 2D single screen arcade arena shooter where you have two different types of matches. One, kill, reach a, a, a kill score before the other players, so kill other players more than the other ones. Or collect these various crates and get enough of them to win a match where you die, you lose all your crates. And that's it. There's a single match mode where you just do one or a tournament thing where you play a handful of matches and the first to get three wins or however many you decide wins. And I really didn't like it this isn't in the same vein as something like tower fall or other similar games where it is a single screen pull back camera so that everyone can see themselves in there and it just didn't feel good you have a gun a sword and can jump around and the the weapons you can find in it 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 felt very derivative of so many games that have come before without doing a single thing to differentiate it or make it stand out from the crowd I, I there might be something I'm missing something there that's new but as someone who hasn't even played that many games like this and hasn't played one in a while I was surprised by how old and uninspired it felt there, there was nothing about it that I, I looked at and, and and said yeah this this is this is newer this is fun it didn't feel good it didn't look good not great music I think there are nine arenas some of the arenas I really fucking hated there was one I think the forest where it's just a few small platforms and then you have all these instances where you fall off a platform and then when you fall off the thing, you don't die. You come back out from the top of the screen. And just there, there'd be times where the AI or me would fall down. And then because there are so few platforms, they just, it just becomes an endless, endless loop of some character or another falling and falling and falling if they don't move over a little bit to fall on a platform, which the AI isn't always as good at, even if you put up the AI's difficulty. It just wasn't fun. I didn't have any fun with it, though I didn't play that much of it. Leo the Firefighter Cat is a very simple, cute little cat game where you go on missions and put out fires. 
Uh, you're putting out actual fires, and then sometimes fires will become sentient of various degrees, a basic enemy or ones that can fling fire at you or have shields somehow. And you, you put them out while using your axe to destroy car doors to save other cats, and that's pretty much all you're doing. Not great texture quality. A little annoying that to go on these missions, you start them, and then the dude will say, hey, get, get in your car or get in the helicopter and go fly to the tunnel so that you can initiate it. Just, just send me on the mission. Why put in that extra step? And on missions, you'll have hidden pinatas to destroy to earn bonuses. And as you level up, you unlock new things. It was, it was, it was fine, but it, it, there's not a whole lot there. Not a lot of variety. Cute enough, but just lacking any reason to really play too much of it it feels okay but yeah i don't know i was curious about it because i like me and my cats i like firefighting games the few i've played the more i think about it even with its some its few issues that fire fire girl dx something along those lines quality game Whenever that's on sale, you should pick it up. Good, it would make a great Switch game or Steam Deck game. That one. But Leo the Firefighter Cat, it's okay. It's okay. Just putting out fires and saving, rescuing cats. And that's, that's that. Ikone Island and Earthlock Adventure is part of Farming Sim, part adventure as the title puts it. I believe the Earthlock games, Earthlock, yes, Earthlock, were more traditional, old school, turn-based RPGs. And this is different in that you shipwreck on an island with four different people who you can switch between. They all have their own inventories, their own looks. And then you're going on this island in a very linear fashion, which is off-putting for me, as you are opening up more and more of it by completing various objectives for these relics, or, or I forget the term for them, where they'll ask you for certain resources in order to open up this pathway to a new area that'll give you access to other resources. And... It, it it looks nice, but the actual stuff you're doing, it, it, it kind of feels like it wants to do too much. The farming stuff is whatever. It's very limited early on. You have this treehouse you fix up and you move into, but then they introduce combat pretty early on and the combat feels really bad. That's where I was most turned off because the exploring of the island and seeing more of it, you get to these parts where stuff is shrouded in darkness and fog, and then you'll interact with some stuff and release the fog by completing these various objectives where a, a, a certain relic, or not relic, but like a, a statue or something will want certain resources. It'll want five leaves and four of these petals and so on, and then you do it, and then you bring back life to the area. Uh, the comet though is so bad it feels awful and the game has a surprising amount of story early on as well I was just like what let me let me play. this is an issue I always have with games let me play first all right let, let's pace this out a bit better games often struggle with pacing in terms of their story but it just I didn't see what was there that I couldn't get better in something else and yeah 
didn't didn't spend too much time with it after the introduction of combat where I'm not sure if combat's going to be a significant part of it because part of it is where there's a night day cycle and at night that's when you have to deal with enemies and I just, I don't I, I don't I'm not gonna want to deal with these because this is very unfun to do but you can interact with some of the friendly creatures feed them the food they want and then they become a companion you can pet them stuff like that it's, it's fine it's a lot of standard stuff the last is that is again though Ikane Island an Earthlock adventure last game though is Road Defense Outsiders which is a tower defense game where you have a handful of towers in these few levels and you start the the level by opening the gate and letting these cars go through these transports and you have to protect them you protect them with the towers but also through yourself and your standard gun to kill enemies in their various waves and as you kill the enemies they'll drop little currencies that level you up over time in a very sur not survive survivor like that was the name of that fucking game it's not jedi survivors <laughs> vampire survivors and, and a very survivors like in that sense of a an all shooter except you are manually shooting you it is a twin six shooter in that sense or you were using the analog stick and then the right analog, the right trigger to shoot uh, you're using the right analog stick to aim and the right trigger to shoot. And I kind of wish it was an auto shooter for you at least. I feel like that would make me maybe like it more. So I am, I, I'm like, the, the way it works is that you take on these waves and after each wave, if you successfully protect the vehicle and it gets to the end of the line, because what you're doing is trying to protect them so that they'll pay you a toll essentially. And then you use that money to buy various turrets, weapons for the towers in each level. And as you progress, the waves get more and more challenging, as you would expect. And it's, 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 it's I like the look of it. The thing about it is it's very clearly designed around you having to play over and over again to earn currency, which the currency is how many kills you've gotten. So you have this skull and bone currency that you use to give yourself permanent upgrades for your specific run. And the thing about it is that each of your, a run will have an end point. And then you'll have to restart from the very beginning. You'll lose all your upgrades, I'm, I'm assuming because there's this panic level and that's with each, I don't think fail level, but each car that's destroyed, each transport that's destroyed, it goes up a little bit. When that hits max, I'm pretty sure it's just gonna be game over, start over and uh, start over new upgrades. But it feels very much like a game where you have to replay these things over and over and over again so that you can get these permanent upgrades to make it easier and make it actually viable to get through this level and that level. And so it's in your best interest to focus on the earlier levels that you can do and manage so that you can better get these upgrades so that you'll be able to do the, the future levels without getting destroyed so quickly. It... It's super simple and super basic, and I find the gameplay design of that to be a little frustrating. Yet, I put more time into this than some of the other games just because that, that gameplay loop, it happens very quick. So you'll play a level in a few minutes, depending on the level you're doing. Start, and then you you die, you, you lose, re redo another one. It's easy to just go and do another one. I don't know. And there, there is that part of it that I do like in that I am a sucker for games that involve leveling and upgrading. And so I'm constantly earning enough things to upgrade various stats like 
the number of bullets I fire, the amount of damage my gun does, how fast I reload, how much health I have, how fastly I regenerate, how much armor I have, how strong the weapon on the cars are, if they even have a weapon, how strong their shields are, how strong they re regenerate, how fast I move, how strong my drone is once I get a drone, how much health I have. If there's so many things to upgrade, how much starting money I have, which is good, because then you could put up some towers right away. I, I, I'm not going to say it's a great game or anything, but there's just other... I, I'm just a sucker for it, and you may be sucker for it too. That is, again, Road Defense Outsiders. And that is it for this year episode of the Pixelated Saucer Show. Once again, I am Marcus Nez. Y'all can find me pretty much everywhere at PX Sausage. If you enjoy this here show or any of the stuff I do and what have you, you can support me and my nonsense over at patreon.com slash PXS. There you can get access to a monthly Q&A, some fancy Discord roles, a private Discord channel, random drops here and there, and more depending on your tier. Or you can just support me to support me if that is your fancy. In addition to the Patreon, you can find links to the YouTube, the site, the Discord, and so much more over at pxsausage.com. But that is it. That is all. As always, thank you for watching or listening. I hope you enjoyed this year episode, and I hope you have both a wonderful rest of your day, a lovely rest of your week, and a wonderful weekend. But for now, adios, uh, Rivaderci.